Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cropper here. I'd like to inaugurate a new series. The series about war history. Now, I was going to do a proper history of war, which would start, of course, as far back as I could go. In, you know, as far back as, as bow and arrow um, and such. But, I mentioned way too much of that in my series of Ancient Greece, series of Ancient Engineering, and the series of the rise of civilization. I have covered the history of ancient warfare like a road covered in tar or something like that. So, modern warfare is where we're going to go because I do have an excellent textbook for us to take a bit from. American Military History and the Evolution of Western Warfare. Now, if you watched my 17 video series on Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War, then you will recognize some material from I think about page 100 or so. That will be way later, way many videos down and we'll probably skip it and just give a quick synopsis of it rather than go over that uh, stuff that's already in the other series. So here we are with, oh by the way, I'll mention the authors. D-O-U-G-H-T, Dowdy, Gruber, Flint, Grimsley, Herring, Howard, Lynn, L-Y-N-N, -N, and Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y. This was published in 1996 by D.C. Heath and Company. It's a textbook. All right. Uh, this is American military history. So it's going to start uh, not with the Spanish Wars, which would be maybe better to, to give a little bit of a history of those, but it skips those. It's just the Anglo-American warfare that we're going to start with. All right. Just as Europeans of the 17th and 18th centuries suffered through the succession of wars, so too did their colonists in North America. There were wars going on in, in Europe there as, as well. The English, who were far more numerous than other European colonists, and more determined to establish permanent settlements... Now, that's interesting. Um, they got pr particularly hostile responses from their neighbors in the New World. No, not really, because the Spanish went with just the idea of stealing gold, and people were pretty hostile to them, too. After a while, they calmed down and changed their tune, and, and never the Spanish never were um, bent on putting up colonies over here that were permanent and long-term paying endeavors. They just wanted to get gold and bring it back. That's, that's how it started, and that's how it went on for decades and decades after Columbus discovered it. They were not doing it for a, product, a productive enterprise. The English didn't want to at first either. This isn't the history of the establishment of the colonies, but I'll just go real quick here. The English didn't want at first to establish permanent colonies, and in some of the early colonies uh, they had to sort of fight over what they were supposed to do. Are they supposed to go out and go on hunting raids and uh, steal from Indians and get rich, or should they clear some forest land and plant some some plants or something. So um, it wasn't even obvious to the British, but the British much more quickly when they came started establishing permanent profitable enterprises. Um, not so much the Spanish. Uh, the Spanish, by the way, inherited more of a statist society from the 700 year war with, uh, with Islam and they were more influenced by Muslims. Or I should say Islam actually than Britain was, and Britain was therefore more open to trade and, and progress. The difference between the British idea and the shorter term Spanish idea uh, bears its mark on all of the states that have inherited the Spanish culture to this day, and bears its mark on all of the states that have inherited the British culture as well. So uh, Spain and Britain were very much at odds in very many ways and continue to this day the, the areas of the globe that have inherited them continue to be rather at odds in their way of life and culture if not at odds explicitly with arms we're not necessarily going to invade South America or anything anytime soon and Mexico's not planning to invade us they are invading us ha 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 no. I'm in favor of in immigration now back to the subject ladies and gentlemen you off often get me off on these tangents Okay, for more than one-third of their years as colonists, the English were at war. 
At first, for nearly three quarters of a century, they fought mainly with American Indians, and for another 75 years with other European colonists and their Indian allies in wars that were loose extensions of struggles for power in Europe. Oftentimes, there was a war in Europe that would spill over into America, um, and some of the first world wars uh, were supposedly way before the 1900s. Clear back in the 1700s was the first world war, supposedly, where there was fighting in China and India and Australia and South Africa and uh, the Spanish uh, colonies and islands and North America. Sounds like a world war to me. Finally, in a long complex, complex war for the conquest of Canada, the French and Indian War from 1754 to 1763, they fought against combinations of European regulars, other colonists, and American Indians. Except during the last years of the colonial period when British colonists fought with and against regular European forces, with them on, on their side and against them, except during those last years, warfare in America bore little resemblance to that in Europe. So in the very last years of the colonial period, it came to reserve, re resemble uh, civilized warfare, European civilized warfare. Just in the last few years. Prior to that, though, it didn't. Or little, little resemblance, more guerrilla warfare. At a time when European states were supporting ever larger standing armies and waging limited wars, the English colonies in North America were relying on their militia, or on expeditionary forces drawn occasionally from the militia, to wage nearly unlimited wars of conquest. Colonial forces did use many of the same weapons as regulars, and they sometimes tried to adopt regular methods of marching and firing. Otherwise, colonial forces were raised, trained, and employed very differently than the standing armies of Europe. I pause there for a second. It says that they waged unlimited wars of conquest. Put that in your pocket, and we'll pull it out later, because we're going to see what that means. Neither militia nor provincial expeditionary forces had the organizational permanence of a regular army. And neither had anything like the discipline or training. Their fortifications were primitive of, of a regular army. Their fortifications were primitive. Their system of supply was rudimentary. And regular linear, linear tactics, combined, combined arms, warfare, and siegecraft were completely beyond their competence. Linear tactics... Combined armed warfare, you know, using cannons along with it, and siege craft were completely beyond their competence. It's the early American uh, colonials. Indeed, colonial forces were little more than unskilled infantry equipped with handguns and light artillery and capable of firing only in loose formations. They tried mainly to exhaust their enemies with small skirmishes and the destruction of their food and shelter, but in their own primitive way, colonial forces fought for far higher stakes than the standing armies of Europe. Right? The standing armies of Europe are just poor schleps who got in the army some way or other. And they have to wear this uniform and do what they're told. But the army in America is fighting for their homes. The first English colonists to settle permanently in the New World expected to have to fight to sustain themselves. And they did. During the 17th century, they were most often at war with the American Indians, and only occasionally with themselves or other Europeans. They had hoped to take possession of undeveloped lands in America, to trade with or employ Indians, and to spread the Protestant faith. A lot of early people did want to trade with the Indians, and they advocated that as a way of taming them. They were prepared to destroy anyone who opposed them. They soon found that some Indians were hostile at first meeting and that many others became so in time. Indians resented being coerced, being forced to provide food for the English. Yeah, they were robbed. Or to accept English laws and religious practices. Right? People say that religious, religion is tolerant. No one is less tolerant than a religious person. You come to the Indians and you're not going to tolerate their godless heathen ways. You're going to burn them on a cross or something. You've got God's permission. Why not? Toleration. <laughs> All right. They also resented being disparaged as a primitive people and becoming economically and culturally dependent on the English. That's bullshit. I think that's Marxism in there. Um, 
they resented being disparaged. No, I think this is just a classic.